Tonight's performers later on are uh, King PC and uh, Lady Six, both Pacific New Zealanders. And uh, most fittingly so, as the theme of uh, this entire series of lakes is migration. In the last series, we looked at the idea of identity and its myriad forms. And like that, this new series draws on another key theme of the museum and its collections. And so to this evening's quarter. Uh, we thought we might as well begin at the end, because that's the kind of people we are, so to speak. Um, by addressing the very modern idea of migration in terms of the often discussed phenomenon of globalization. In particular, what globalization in an economic sense has meant human migration as industries and jobs have become increasingly mobile, and what have been the implications for people? And what of the migration of ideas and ideologies that have shaped the physical migrations I just mentioned? Into this interconnected world, of course, the pressing crisis of global climate change um, enters. If climate change is real and unavoidable, what are the consequences for humans and for plant and animal species? Um, in our part of the Pacific, these questions are urgent, uh, not least for the inhabitants of the islands and the atolls, threatened by rising sea levels, but also for countries like New Zealand that will have to deal with the potential wave of the so-called climate refugees, <coughs> that is an accurate term or not. We're dealing with things that haven't happened before. We're dealing with challenges beyond the norms that we really have, the institutional and other capacity to deal with. And that's why there's a challenge, not just in terms of finding some technological fix, it's about building institutions, new ways of looking at problems, new ways of defining them, and new ways of solving them, we hope. Uh, and the urgency is unquestionably there. Uh, the IPCC reports in the last uh, two decades which I've been reviewing and uh, trying to address. At each occasion, the real results of what's happening in the real world have always been on the higher end of all the three scenarios. The world of economics and business, of course, feeds directly into the environmental consequences of what business does. Um, so now we're, in, we're engaged in this process, which um, I'm going to ask Rod about, uh, whereby we've been told that the problems the market has thrown up can be solved by a market mechanism, which to me strikes me as a paradox to say the least. But he's just had his head inside the Select Committee report um, on emissions trading, and I just wanted to get his impressions of it as a practical document that will save us from Armageddon. Uh, <laughs> um, can I just start by boarding it out uh, in a very big way, which is it's not just about business and markets because it's actually the environmental consequences of how we live. Um, so we, even if the government ran everything um, and we were sort of having the same sort of lifestyle, we would have the same problem. So it's not just about business and markets, it's actually about you know, the technology we use um, and the way we use resources and all the rest. Um, is it possible for markets to um, be part of the answer, big part of the answer? Um, I think it is, but it's quite a, 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 a leap of faith um, when we look at what happens with markets generally. Um, we just look, for example, what's been happening to financial markets over the last two or three years. Um, but the basic idea, uh, the basic concept, that when you start valuing something, um, you then start to measure it and manage it in different ways, I think is the underlying principle. So at the moment, uh, we have no price on carbon. Um, we just sort of spew it out into the atmosphere um, because it's a, it's a waste product we don't need to deal with. But if we start to put a price on it, um, we then start to measure it and find ways to reduce it or find ways to use it for something else. So. One of my favorite examples about that last point, about turning things on its head, is that, sorry, this is going to be really scary statistic here, and this is from Fonterra. For every liter of milk that um, our cows produce and we process and, and ship off to market, um, um, that process generates almost a kilogram of greenhouse gases. So 16 billion liters of milk a year here in New Zealand is about 15 million tons. And so most farmers think, oh, for God's sake, don't put us in an emissions trading scheme, we'll all go bust. 
can start charging us for that. But if you look at what's going up into the air and out into the water, that's about 15 million tons of nutrients. And so if you start putting a price on it, farmers might say, whoa, I better stop wasting that. I better find a different way to use it. So perhaps there's something about how I change the science of how I farm or the management practice farm management practices I use to close that loop. And so we're not wasting 15 million tons of nutrients a year. We're finding ways to have healthier soil and, and more productive soil and more productive cows so we can produce more food. So it, it's only trying to find mechanisms to drive that sort of change. And we don't stand any chance of um, survive, surviving, and I say we, you know, we talk grandly about saving the planet, we're actually only trying to save ourselves. It's the human beings which will disappear, but the planet will keep going in some changed form. And there's no hope at all of um, the human population plateauing as it might around about 2050 at about 9 or 10 billion people um, using the sort of technology we use now and the way we use it. And, and technology itself is not the answer, but Technology and markets and changing values and changing perceptions um, are all fundamentally important um, to try to turn this around. I mean, in New Zealand, it strikes me that we are we're a small player in terms of emissions and emissions trading. Yes, we have to do our bit, but it strikes me we're not one of the countries that is in the greatest danger of the kind of um, refugee movements you might see because of environmental degradation as a result of climate change. So I'm interested in what John thinks about whether mechanisms like in emissions trading schemes can really uh, mitigate the, the worst effects of, of what we fear might happen. Look, I agree with the point you just made. Uh, emissions trading is part of the process. They're not the full solution. They're like a toolbox. Uh, when you go out to do something, uh, usually when you have sophisticated complex problems, you go out with a toolbox with multiple tools in it. And this famous old adage, if the only thing you've got a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. And if you just use emissions trading, you start treating the whole thing as being resolved by using market mechanisms. Markets are critically important, and one of the characters that's just been explained is that we tend to externalize a whole lot of things, and we throw them on to future generations to cope with, like CO2, because they get a better price. One of the problems I think we've got is that um, looking at the problem of climate change, it is the big one, it's the sort of elephant that's been in the room for quite a long time, which we've not really been prepared to look at, honestly, is to try to face it front on um, and start to look at what sort of implications it has. What you see now with the IPCC, in the past, the um, IPCC is the, the um, uh, panel of climate change um, coming out of the climate change convention of 19. 92, which came to existence in, uh, in Rio. Uh, now that has basically come out with reports ever since, and the basic assumption was that we have to deal with mitigation, we've got to prevent CO2. Now that's been the, the rhetoric and the aim of the world community for the last uh, decade or more. The reality is now in Copenhagen is we're looking at adaptation equally as much as mitigation. We have already defined what will happen in 2030. There's a, basically a 30 year lead time in CO2. We are living in the 1970s. Think of the difference between the 1970s and now. In other words, we've got a horizon in which we are affecting the future of our children, grandchildren, in exactly what we do now. And as you pointed out, the footprint of each of us is monumental in terms of the resources we use in our customary day of life. We I don't expect anybody here is greedy or unnecessarily believe they're over-consuming, but the technology that we use, the way we live, is not sustainable. If every Chinese and every Indian was to live as we do, we would have to have between 8 and 10 planets. We're already using 1.5 planets of the size of the Earth in terms of the sustainability of the resources. How do we move from this pattern of life to set examples as the leading uh, developed world for the rest of the world community over a period which is going to be very short. We have lost 
I think, a decade or more. The Bush era, as we in Australia call it, the Howard era, denial of the reality was a sort of putting our head in the sand, putting our head back in the trough, consuming as much as we can, assuming that markets would ultimately resolve, that technological fixes would come along and we'd basically have solutions. It is much more complex than that. And I think this is where we have to look at uh, changes in our priorities, changes in the way we look at solutions, and then I think is really throwing up innovation. It's not just technological innovation, it's organizational innovation. It's social innovation. And there are plenty of opportunities. Now, coming back to your question, which was looking at some of the long-term effects in our region, we have real, you say, we think about New Zealand as we've been written up as a place where it's best to be under climate change. In Australia, one of the worst. Uh, but what's interesting is I throw this out to you to think about. While you can sort of bunker down in this green and pleasant land with a, its continuing high rainfall and likely to have less impact than elsewhere, if you think of our region as a whole, um, about a 0.5 uh, meter increase in sea levels, which is quite possible um, over the next two to three decades, would in Indonesia alone produce between three to five million refugees. We call them refugees, it's not too there's no such thing as environmental refugees. They don't have that status. Displaced people, where would they go? If you look around India, elsewhere, where the majority of people on Earth live within about 40 k's of the coast, what happens? Do they enlarge the highly populated areas, move inland, fight with the people who are behind them? Or do they get into boats and start desperately going somewhere? How do we do it? In Australia, we have, we've had already a problem over boat people turning up on our doorstep. And we talk about several millions of people turning up, not just on Australia's shore, but on New Zealand. How would you deal with them? Do you shoot them? Do you embrace them? How do we think about the consequences of the Pacific alone, where we are, by our own behavior, leading to the displacement of large numbers of people? They haven't produced the CO2 that's caused the change. What's the moral implications of our relationship to that? Uh, are we capable of creating the space for large numbers of people? There's been scenarios put forward. These are, of course, scenarios. There's no certainty about them. Of anything between 50, 100, 200 million people displaced globally as climatic and agricultural systems shift. It's a question of the scale of what we're doing and the scale of what we have to confront. It's really going to throw up, I think, very significant challenges for all of us, even if we're in reasonably well-heeled and comfortable environments. It's a question of how long that will be. We cannot disconnect ourselves, in other words, from what's happening globally within our own comfort zones. And that's really, I think, uh, the overall um, markets and governments um, follow people um, rather than lead. Um, and time is very short. Um, the sort of um, change that we need to make is very, very profound. And it's only going to happen if it's us that drives that. You know, each of us individually, a bunch of people in this room, this town, this country, you know, around the world. And, and it seems to me that um, the three crucial conditions there is that um, we need to um, become uh, a lot more excited about and comfortable about change. Um, we need to want to embrace change. We need to want to be um, enthusiastic that there is um, you know, better solutions out there. The second thing is we, we need to understand what um, those environmental and economic and social pressures are and what true sustainability means. And the third thing is we have to really embrace that concept of interdependence. The issue is that, on the one hand, the media is trying to sell things to people, most of the commercial media. It's trying to encourage people to buy. That's where they get their advertising revenue from. That's a bit simplistic, but it needs to be born in line. So the idea of selling people something other than random consumption is a sort of contradiction to our self-interest. So the idea of frightening the horses about the consumer is really a way of reinforcing a conservatism the media does, and also creating a sort of business as usual uh, notion that really we're about keeping everything in balance and not moving too quickly, not being too taken off course because of the 
the balance of our societies are quite sophisticated conflict. I think that is always a problem when we're facing with sudden and significant process of change. And bringing the, the public along in this reality is really a function of the media. And we have this problem between the gap between the interests of the media as a commercial interest and the interests of the media in this old tradition of the fourth estate, a part of governance itself, to inform the citizens about the reality of what's going on in their world and their society, so that they can adjust their behavior appropriately. The market system drives it. 